there's this line in Fight Club, Tyler Durden says, it's not until you lose everything that you're free to do anything. And I, man, believe it. Welcome to the stage, Nicholas Fairley. How do I start to try? What can I do? What's the next thing I can do? Most unselfish thing a person could do is expand. No other option besides hard work. How they can live this three-dimensional lifestyle. YouTube, what's going on? In today's episode, we talk all about divorce and building influence through hard times. How you go out there and actually get your mission, your vision out there, even when crazy things are going on. I have the best person to teach you guys how to do that yet. Also, if you are listening to these interviews, you're going to want to hit that subscribe button. Also, there's a bell that you can ring that gives you notifications when these things come out so you don't miss anything. Again, if you wanted to learn from these people personally, it'd be a ridiculous amount of money, and I'm extracting the gold out of their lives so you get them in bite-sized chunks inside of interviews just like this. Also, if you have not joined our community of like-minded businessmen, we have 6,000 men in one community called the Billion Dollar Brotherhood on Facebook. Go check that out in the links down below. And today's episode is going to be absolutely fire. This guy has over 450,000 followers just on Instagram alone. He's a New York Times bestselling author and also has gone through some really, really difficult times. He said one of the hardest times in his entire life and has been able to recover in a way where literally his life is flourishing more than ever, even in the midst of walking through the valley, walking through the valley of shadow of death. Welcome, Mr. Dave Hollis. Dave, welcome back to the BDB podcast, man. Oh, it's so good to be back, Nicholas. Thanks for having me back. A hundred percent. I'm really excited for this. Last time we talked, it's so cool because your life has changed so much. You're more tan. (laughs) <laughs> you're more fit. I, right? I just got done with a workout just now. I feel that you're maybe present on social media a little bit more. I don't know if you'd agree with that. Maybe I'm just consuming your stuff a little bit more, but the stories are rolling. And I always really appreciate that. Uh, there's always someone every single day, I feel, that is putting out content. And no matter when you look, there's always someone like throwing stuff out there. And oftentimes I feel that people look at that and go, I'm so far behind. I'm not I'm not throwing out content, not knowing that actually people are like coming and going. They take days off, they take weeks off. I just want to honor you first off on your consistency and just how you've been living your life recently. I think it's really, really cool. So I want to start off that way. Thanks, brother. I appreciate that. Yeah, I see it from a distance. So the last time that we talked, we talked like all about your past career and how you've had success and stuff. I would love just a update, life update on what's been your main focuses and passions and things that you've been working on. Obviously, your life's changed a ton. So I'd love to hear all about it. Yeah, well, I mean, since we last talked, man, everything in my life has changed in so many ways. And in uh, in so many great ways, though, at the time that some of these tra- changes were happening, I don't know that I would have appreciated that they might produce the good that would come through the experiencing of hard stuff. But uh, since we last talked, I've transitioned away from my marriage. I was married for 16 years, got a divorce, and for the first time, trying to figure out what it means to be a single dad getting back into a dating pool after 20 years of time, insanity on so many levels, but uh, the healing that came and the processing of grief that comes from mourning what was the exhilarating and also terrifying blank page that you find yourself handed when your identity, your sanity, your comfort, your ideal around control are all shattered. And you have to now paint a picture of what next and what the future ends up looking like when it doesn't look like it was previously going to look. Uh, up to that, I left, we talked last time about my having departed from the Walt Disney Company to work inside of the entrepreneurial space. I've now subsequently left this company that I helped build with my ex-wife and am now doing stuff on my own. And so figuring out what this looks like Without the team that I previously had in a world where I'm on my own, I have a next book that's coming out here in October. So I'm super excited about the way that writing that book with a lot of the emotion that was coming in the midst of transition, helping fuel the words that were going into it, have made it what it ends up being. I've just recently launched a website and some coaching and a new community challenge. So there are some really, really exciting things that are happening, but like the stuff that I'm working on is somewhat similar to what I was working on when last we talked in that I'm trying to create tools that if you were to put them into people's hands might afford them an opportunity to have breakthroughs for the kind of life they deserve. The like, I think single biggest thing that I have been personally working on that I wanna try and help the people that I'm in community work on also 
is the recognition of what I have been uniquely put on this planet for. I believe that you and anyone listening, each of us, we were created with very intentional, very deliberate design. And that that creator's intention is a thing that we're on this planet to attempt to honor. How do we honor the intention of our creator every day in the actions that we take in the way that we show up in relationship and the way that we pour our skills into something vocationally. And so I'm trying to do that, right? Every single day. I know I've been given a very specific kind of gift set. I know I've been through experiences that are wholly and totally unique. I know that I think, feel, and love in ways that are different from every other person on the planet. How can I take all those things and hopefully create resources or share stories that might help people feel seen, help them have some answers, and help them have a deeper a sense of purpose and uh, help them uh, you know, honor the intention of why they were put on this planet in the first place as well. I think it's a really cool way to look at it because people oftentimes think there's always someone better than them in their industry or they're not good enough. They don't have enough skills, resources. They don't look good enough. They're not tall enough. They're not fast, whatever the thing is. And when you're putting in that perspective of I've been put here for a reason, I have a unique kind of niche where even in the business world, we would say in competitors that they could reach people that I can't reach because you know, my story, most of my guys, like they're coaches or service-based businesses because I came from the service-based business world and I don't have a ton of e-commerce guys because I just don't talk about it. It's like just not my, part of my story. And so like somehow they just don't connect. And so these people having a unique niche area of life and attacking it that way, I think it takes away some of those things where they're like, I'm put here for a reason. I'm going to do my thing and figure out more and more what that thing is. I think that's really awesome. So a couple of questions I have for you. Because I'm really impressed, frankly, with how you've, they, I think rebound would be a word that the common world would use. But, you know, going through divorce obviously isn't easy. I have a father that my mother and my father got divorced when they were, when I was four. And then my dad got divorced when I was older from my stepmom. And I saw that also other people in my life, like one of my mentors, Yost, as well as uh, some great friends of mine that are actually in the brotherhood, immerse themselves in community and like really, maybe recover quickly. Was there anything that you feel that was like a lot harder that you, than you expected through that process? And was there anything that was potentially easier than you thought it was going to be? Well, every, I mean, number one, it was hard. So I don't want to sugarcoat and downplay at all. Like if you have been through divorce, you know, it is, it's a death and you know, like, like, like honor- internally or like what, explain that to me. Well, I mean, what died in part for me was the vision of how I thought my life was going to go, right? Like I had a vision for what a 65th birthday party was going to look like or how a business that we were scaling was going to achieve certain things five years from now or the way that, you know, any of those things. And in that divorce, in one fell swoop, all of those things in identity there was, you know, I, I, in my next book, I wrote this chapter about the story of Lazarus, this man in the Bible who has to die to be brought back to life. And there were so many stories leading to the recognition of Lazarus where I re- represent like, hey, there's so many business stories where people had to go through adversity to have their breakthroughs. And there's something so important about facing hard things so that you can build the thing that you're hoping to build. And so um, in this like particular chapter, though, I dive into this recognition that certain things in my life had to die in order for me to be reborn. And so as I was thinking about like, well, what had to die? Like in some respects, ego had to die. Normalcy had to die. Comfort had to die. Identity had to die. A sense of control had to die. And in the death of those things, I was the architect of how they would be reborn. And so in a lot of ways, as much as, man, it was crushing and there was so much grief, there was also this freedom that came in being able to design whatever next looked like now that next was nothing like it was ever meant to be before. So in that death, there was some resurrection. I was the architect of how it might be resurrected. I was, goodness gracious, surrounded by so many amazing people who were also complicit in helping me cast a vision for how I might reach this better version of who I am today and who I'd hope to be better as in the future. But there's this line in Fight Club, Tyler Durden says, it's not until you lose everything that you're free to do anything. And I, man, believe it because in divorce, there is somewhat a sense of having lost everything that you thought would happen 
in a way that now leaves you free to develop and design whatever, anything, all of whatever will serve your becoming this next version of yourself. So in the perspective of some of these guys that are listening, that maybe have gone through this as well or are going through it or something like that, are there some key things that you would recommend for them to do to be able to make sure that they walk through this journey empowered? Well, the most important thing that I did was instead of, because I'd always been a little bit more of a long-term goal setting person, I had to go to extraordinarily short-term goal setting. (laughs) And in uh, what would, you know, went from like a one year or five year vision for where I was trying to head, I was like, you know, one, two, three months from now, where do I need to be? because it was overwhelming to try and contemplate what 12 months or five years might mean when I was floundering a little bit to even understand what normal days were gonna feel and look like. And I started at the very beginning asking a single question, what do I need in this season to become the version of who I'd hope to be three months from now today, right? So what do I need in this season? And I did it against the five dimensions of health as I'm thinking about holistic health. So what do I need for my physical, my mental, my emotional, my relational, and my spiritual health? And in each of those things, I tried to identify one, two, or three things for my physical, my mental, my emotional, my spiritual, and my relational health, and saw how I might be able to apply one or two of those things in my daily routine, one or two of those things in a weekly or monthly routine, so that I was able to tend to my health in a way that would help me move from where I was on that day to where I'd hope to be 30 to 90 days from then. And I just kept tweaking and adjusting those what do I need in the season questions and answers to accommodate progress. And man, like, what do I need emotionally at that time? I needed a professional freaking help from a therapist. What did I need physically? I needed to challenge myself to push towards a physical challenge that was bigger than you were I like you I were like running a ton of. at the time right like I you mean, were out there are you I running put up, I put up 200 mile months in yeah. three consecutive months after the divorce I mean I was a running beast but that kind of like the first month when I said I'm gonna run 200 miles this month I'd never done it in my life but what did I need in this season physically I needed to set a physical challenge for myself that showed me how strong I could be so that it would reframe, rewire how strong I believed I could be, not just physically, but in any other part of my life. I went from the running to then training for a triathlon to like a whole bunch of other things, but like every season needing to have something physically that I was pushing myself toward was having this knock on effect to mental strength and emotional strength. Um, I mean, I, I ended up diving into some therapy around something called internal family systems, which is the idea of getting to know self and your parts. And what I needed in my emotional health in this journey was to understand what I was feeling. And so I just, I found this way to make a relationship with my grief, with my sadness, with my anxiety that allowed me to as self be in conversation with these parts that was just life-changingly refreshing, but also instead of being sad, I was witness to my sadness. Instead of being anxious, I was witness to and in conversation with my anxiety. It didn't mean that those parts were present. I honored the fact that they were there. But as much as it may sound like a crazy person talking right now, my ability to have a conversation with those emotions and understand why they were presenting themselves and what they were hoping to gain by being present allowed me to honor them and process them and create plans to work with and through that in a way that I think expedited some of their feeling like they needed to remain present. And you talked a lot about identity. When you're saying this, it kind of sounds like you're not accepting it as part of your identity. You are not anxious. You are not any of these things that you're experiencing. But when I'm hearing it, you're recognizing them as almost like a flare up, right? You have a swollen wrist. You ask yourself, you don't call yourself, I'm a, I have a swollen, I'm a swollen wrist, but also you ask, why do I have a swollen wrist? Cause it's a manifestation of something else. So it's almost like you were like, why am I feeling this way? What, what are you here for? What's, what's the thing that I need? Almost like it's like a positive thing, which I think is very well, what's, interesting. What's Hopefully I took away what you're talking Oh about. no. I mean, that, 
that's exactly what it is. Just to like give a practical example with anxiety in particular, because so many people, I'm sure plenty of you listeners struggle with anxiety. So do I. But my relationship with anxiety has turned from one of not loving it being present to actually having just a tiny bit of gratitude for its emergence because of the role that it plays. I named my anxiety, it's named Clark, uh, don't ask why. And Clark, when Clark presents itself, now invites me to have a conversation. Hey, Clark, why are you here? I know it sounds insane, but why are you here? We have this conversation and Clark is able to point out places in my life where there is just enough ambiguity still, where the absence of a plan has him feeling like he needs to become present. And so in a crazy way, this anxiety now has drawn my attention to an area of my life where if I were to deploy a plan, just get a little more specificity in a place where ambiguity currently exists, Clark feels like he's done his job and Clark gets to go away. I feel safe. I feel secure. I feel more confident. I know where I'm going because the plan has been applied in that ambiguous place and the role that anxiety was playing has been served. And I'm not talking about clinical anxiety. This is situational anxiety, right? When you get a situational burst of anxiety, it's there for a reason. If you can have a conversation, understand why, it might just leave you the trail of breadcrumbs to help you solve why it believes itself to be there, which it believes it to be helpful, even if it doesn't feel great when it shows up. That is really good. And let's stick on this whole thing of identity then. Many people that I've seen, I've, I've seen friends before, maybe they were a certain way, like let's say their true self, because uh, I, I don't want to talk about people that are not being themselves, but let's say the true version of themselves, they get married over years, sometimes inside relationships. And I'm hoping this can help some of the married guys as well as guys in relationships and all around really, because talk about identity. You talked about even a loss of a job or a career or a business that can sometimes be an identity, just the same as being married or any of these other things. So inside the place of identity, let's say that you have this identity with yourself that you're like, you're this certain type of person when you're, when you're by yourself. And I see some of these guys, they get, they break up and they act completely different. They're like a whole different person. You're like, where's that been the whole time? No wonder you broke up. Like you never were even able to be yourself that whole time. And I remember the story from one of my Navy SEAL mentors. He uh, used to swim with his wife and she used to swim with him. So they go swimming and he ended up after a while, he's sick of it, but she act, she seemed like she liked it so much. So for like years, they kept swimming. Then one day she goes, I hate swimming. I can't do it anymore. He goes, I, I liked it like five years ago, but I don't like it anymore. I'm doing it because you, you like it so much. And then they both were doing <laughs> something they hated to make each other happy. And, and so was there anything in this process now looking back, because obviously you're in healthy relationships now and, and not that this was unhealthy, but you've grown, right? Is there anything that you learned around identity for some, that some of these guys can pick up around? How can they be the, their best self consistently and not change their identity based on their relationship? Was there anything new you learned about yourself when you're out of this marriage and you're like, my gosh, like I'm discovering new things about myself that like I wasn't expressing back then for some odd reason, just anything around that I would love to be able, I would love to hear it. Yeah, you know, it's so interesting because I think there were definitely times where, I mean, one of the questions that prompted us getting divorced, my wife, my ex-wife asked me, do you think you can be the man God created you to be married to me, right? Like there was a dynamic inside of our relationship and there were certain ways that we each were acting that had her wondering if I could be the person God put me on the planet to be if we were married. And it prompted then another set of questions around who I was if I wasn't her husband, right? Because when it came to identity, my primary identity was husband. And in having assumed that primary identity, there were, there were parts of my true self that just became lost in service to that identity, that there were times when if you asked, what do you like? or what do you want to do with your free time that I would have struggled to answer it outside the context of what my identity as husband might suggest I need to like or need to do first, mm -hmm. right? Like I've unpacked plenty of things inside of a conversation around codependency in the aftermath of the relationship wow. because each of us had some codependent tendencies that, man, we talked about for years prior to our divorce. And in the aftermath, I think are clear, like, oh man, there were things that we did that probably leaned too much on our worry of how the other might be affected if we were to fully and truly be ourselves. Hmm. And what I think in the aftermath of divorce, I've come to appreciate more than anything is I have to 
be myself. I have to find love for myself. And it's when I can love myself, I can then be loved by someone else. And if I don't find ways to love myself, to cater to and find the way to tap into my own personal passions and pour into the things that I am, again, placed on this planet to do, if I can't do that, then I'm operating in somewhat of a compromised state that's going to compromise the way I show up in other relationships, the way that I feel about myself when I'm by myself. And that's the kind of objectivity that you get when a thing that was a, a frame of sorts that you lived inside of now is taken away and you realize, uh oh, there is no frame. I can now be whoever I want. I'm going to be myself. I'm going to honor myself, love myself, indulge in that in a way that would allow me to show up as my ultimately unique self and, and hopefully best self to those yeah. who I love and want to be in relationship with. Thanks for sharing that. So my question around this as well is you have obviously a big following and it's been really cool. I think for everyone to see how that is your following. Like I've noticed this, right? Like people, like people were saying, oh, like they maybe got followers because of this or this person or like, no, like these people follow you, love you. It's like, you go look at it and see it right away. And, and obviously your consistency, I think really helps with that. Cause I think if you just didn't do anything, of course, no one, no one would know who you are, but I think people have fallen in love with who you are. That's why we're talking right now. And inside of this place, most people that would go through something aren't underneath like a big microscope where everyone's like, has an opinion about everything that you do. And, you know, some people will say things like, if there's a lot of love that can come from that as well, right? A lot of support, a lot of people saying, Oh, I like, I love you. But if you take those as well, sometimes you also open yourselves up yourself up to all the opinions of every random person. They say everyone has their two cents, but it's usually only worth about two cents most time for I'm sure that went through your head, a little bit of fear around that or that public stuff that goes on. I, I would love to hear a little bit about that. Was there any benefits or was there any fears negatively? Like, did you get off social and go, hey, I'm not going to check this out because people have this on large scale, small scales, but I'm sure it's, I don't know if it's just as impactful, maybe harder with the following. Uh, I'll let you talk about it. I, I have no clue. Well, I mean, it's, it's an interesting thing because if there was a single thing that I felt in the experience of being in somewhat of a fishbowl and experiencing the hardest and best year of my life publicly, it's gratitude because I was so fortunate to be able to pretty vulnerably share the experience of grief and growth and, and, and anguish and excitement and all of the both that inevitably you hold in the midst of such big transformation and, and transition. And so I just had so much gratitude for having an opportunity to have a community of people that were open to giving feedback and, and being supportive of and encouraging of, hey, like, thank you for being honest about how hard it is, because mm -hmm. there was something I think humanizing in sharing struggle, right? Like I struggle, you struggle, every listener who's listening struggles. And in a hyper curated world inside of social media, there is a danger of seeing the highlight reel and not seeing what's really real. And so um, my interest was more than anything like, hey, I'm going to come on every once in a while and just talk about what's happening in the hopes that there is a person that may also be going through something like this that could be made to feel just a tiny bit more normal for seeing a little bit of their own struggle reflected in my storytelling. Um, but then also, I mean, I've written about this before, like as a creator, as someone who has a platform, as, as anyone who's listening has any ambition at all to have impact, we have this opportunity out of say 100 people to affect 90 people in a super positive way, but tend to focus on the 10 people who are going to be critical at the expense of affording light to the 90 that are desperately in line waiting to receive it. Mm -hmm. And at a certain point, you just have to appreciate that if someone decides to be critical or give you grief about the hardest thing that you've ever experienced, like my divorce was unbelievably difficult. And if someone wanted to be snarky about it, that is a, that's a reflection of them. That's not a reflection necessarily of me. So 
Um, I don't know. I've tended to be like, I don't want to be uh, a, a rose colored glasses, toxic positivity person in the slightest. Right. So I've tended more than anything to just, I'm going to tell you what's going on. I've cried through it. I've talked through it. I've tried to encourage through it. I brought my God into it. Like I, I've tried to just show like, Hey, this is the journey that I've been on. But I think the reason why the community has felt connected is like they can see a little bit of themselves in my stories. Awesome. Because their notes have helped remind me that my experience was super normal too. And they're like, I think all anyone, not all, but like one of the biggest things that people want to feel is that their experience is somewhat normal, that their experience matters, and that there is the possibility of something good coming from whatever it is that they're going through. And I was a believer of it because of so many people encouraging me who had already been further along their journey. And what a cool gift for me to be able to also potentially for someone who's in this struggle say, hey, I know it sucks and I know it's hard and it's going to be hard, but I also know that it gets better. And thinking about the guys inside the community, they, they're all on social. They have times, they have businesses. They, they have things that they feel like, hey, I have this business, but I also have things that if people knew the things that I've been through, struggled with and overcame, it could really help them. So they have these these resources to help people, whether it's through the business that they run or their personal brand, their messaging, their personal social media. Yeah, how often do they like, man, I, I woke up too late today. Like uh, I'll do social media. I'll, I'll do that stuff tomorrow. Oh, I don't feel like doing videos today. I look so terrible. I feel so bad. And, and so do you see how what you did is pretty insane for stuff? Like <laughs> you hardest time in your life. Oh, like, let me, you know what? Cause here's the deal. If you don't share with anyone and I learned this through my own experience with one of my friends, Cole Hatter, he's a great dad. And one day he shared with me something that he did that made him a great dad. And I asked myself this question, if he didn't share that with me, he would still be a good dad. I would have just missed out on the opportunity to learn how I could be a good dad. So he doesn't need, to like, you don't need to share. You, you would have overcame your grief without sharing with people how you overcame grief. But it gave an opportunity for other people to join in on that process. So what are some of the things for the people out there that are constantly going through, oh, this hard thing, it derailed me. I haven't posted on social media. I really want to help people. I really want to speak. I really want to grow this coaching. I really want to write a book. But every single little thing is derailing them, demotivating them. What's getting you to hit the play button? Is it vision? Is it that help helping one person? Like, what are some of those things that we can have that are bigger than our excuses? I've had times I don't want to interview. I'm like, I don't want to interview people. My house yeah. is flooded. Like my house flooded the other month. And it was like, and then this thing happened and this thing caught on fire. My windshield broke. And you're like, oh, I don't want to do this. My, my freaking studio broke. Let's just reschedule. Though. Let's fit. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's always something. And you've been consistent through what you said was one of the hardest times ever. How, well, how? I mean, I, one of the things I think keeps people from posting or sharing is that they're waiting for things to be going well enough for them to feel like they can post something that is going to reflect uh, positively on them instead of honestly. And so one of the things I had to just get over right away was I was not pulled together at all at the beginning. And yet yeah. I knew that on the, on the, on a like little sign that we made in our kitchen of a bit of a family mantra. One of the last things that's written is to whom much is given much is expected. I, as a person who am going through this experience am doing so from a wild place of privilege and that I have access to some of the coolest friends in personal development who were coming alongside of me and helping me work through how to get through hard things. And I have a relationship with God and a pastor who was very present in helping me work through some bigger picture appreciation for what mattered and what didn't matter at all. And in having, you know, those things, the idea that I wouldn't share some of the insights of what I'd been the beneficiary of or privy to just seemed crazy. But also being able to be honest with people about struggle is something that people think in some ways represents their weakness or they show themselves as being weak, but it has for me been an unbelievable move of strength because every single time I've represented that I'm going through something that's difficult or that I have shame for, or that 
I'm still working through. I get more notes of people who are in the exact same place, appreciate the way that it was normalizing it for them, which in that note normalized it for me. And so to be able to talk about your struggle takes it out of the dark. It allows you to create something of an empathy bridge with someone else who's going through that exact same thing. And when you talk honestly about the things that you're working through, it is the only time you give yourself a fighting chance to get help, to get a resource that might offer the like faster way through the woods or the pass that like gets you to the front of the line because of not having to try and figure it out yourself, but have someone say like, hey, I went through this two years ago. This therapy was so impactful and important in how I was able to process my emotions. I think it would be a huge solve for you. If I hadn't met my therapist, I wouldn't be as far along this journey. If I hadn't been honest about what I was struggling with in identity, I wouldn't have been introduced to my therapist, right? Like if I hadn't been okay to be open in the way that I was online, I wouldn't have had as many people coming to me with, here's the thing that worked for me. Number one, I wouldn't have felt as normal, right? This is a normal thing. Thank you for showing me this because it makes me feel normal. I know that I'm normal. It makes you normal too. But also I just, I wouldn't have gotten the resources. So don't wait for things to be great. If you're, if you're willing, represent your humanity and you will find that you are connected to everyone because every single person is human and seeing something that makes them feel normal against the current of the hyper curated social media world where they feel not normal most of the time when they're looking at someone else's highlight reel is what will inevitably break through. Well, thanks for first off for talking about things that aren't necessarily fun, but super helpful for everyone else. Just like you're talking about, it's not, it, it's helping the other people, even though it's not that fun to necessarily talk about. It's like, it's not fun to reminisce on all these memories and all these things, but I do feel like it's, it's been super impactful so far. So I appreciate you first off for, right on. you know, digging in the trenches with us. And, you know, we could, we could just talk about coaching and be like, well, how are you playing on scale in your coaching business? Like this is fun. How do you promote your books? How, how many times should you post on social media every single day? <laughs> uh, do you comment back to people or not? Like, do you pay someone to do that? Like, there's a lot of things that I think would be super valuable yet what's the thing that's keeping people from doing that and you going through a hard time, I think has been a great example or a hard thing that relates to every single person. Cause everyone's going through something. Uh, I will say this too, just because of what you just said, I would not have, I like, I made this big declaration at the end of 2019 that 2020 was going to be my best year ever as though like I was going to manifest it on into being. And as it turned out, 2020 was in fact my best year ever. I didn't know that I wouldn't get a say in the conditions that would produce my best. It required me going through my hardest year, more sadness and grief than I've ever experienced in my entire life, the death of so many things that were so important to me to get my best year ever, but I got it. What I also had as a benefit inside of that year was an ability to take every single thing that I was feeling and use a book deadline to cathartically write all of my feelings out on paper. It's not like the next book is a deep dive into divorce, but it is a dive into leaving comfort and how you handle unexpected events and transition transformation, becoming the person you'd like to be irrespective of the conditions that you find yourself in. But I also had a podcast, Mike. And man, there are plenty of episodes that will never, ever air. But I found ways to between writing down the words and speaking into a microphone, get all of it out, all of it out. And so if any of you are working inside of these businesses, be it coaching or, or, or whatever, you have access to the kind of things that could cathartically not only help you get through the thing, but would most likely be the most effective things that you could bring to a prospective customer because they are going through the same thing that you are and are desperate to find someone who can normalize it and offer some solutions for how they might also get through the thing that you're gone that you're going through or that you've got gotten through. Boom. So when's the book come out? Do you have a title already? Yeah, book's coming out October 26th. It's called Built Through Courage. Uh, I just actually on Monday kicked off a 90-day countdown. We're doing a challenge, 13 weeks of free coaching that's going to lead up to the release. And I'm super excited about it. It's all about really creating hyper self-awareness of where you are, 
a crystal clear vision of where you want to go and then like the very specific things that will be required for you Huge. to get from where you are to where you want to go. So I'm um, pretty straightforward, but really talking through the lens of this relationship we tend to have with comfort and the familiar at the expense of the kind of growth that exists beyond the safe harbor and what it means to embrace courage, to face your fears, push through that fear into where learning and growth takes place. That is huge. And the coaching you talked about as well, is this gonna? Is this already rolled out? Is this something that people could check out after the book's launch? So here's the cool thing. As a, as a thank you and incentive to anyone who pre-orders the book, you get a Finding Your Why e-course, a Resilience and Mindset course immediately, and then also get jumped into, we've got more than 5,000 people inside of this launch group on Facebook. You get, a, you get immediate access to this free Facebook page where for these 12 weeks, I am teaching on a different topic. Most of them... Uh, something that is covered inside of the book to get people excited. We just had our kickoff week this week and it's going to continue for the next 13. So if uh, you want to pre-order the book, you can buy it anywhere, but then go to mrdavehollis.com forward slash book, drop me an email and I will give you 500 bucks worth of value in exchange for the $15 book that you have bought and drop you into a community with a bunch of like-minded people who are trying to embrace the 90 days. Uh, it's called 90 days of courage, 90 days of courage challenge. Awesome. And for the people listening, go obviously go buy the book, get inside the group. End of story. End of story. Think about how much stuff like you've gone through in your life and, and you put it all into a book. It's 15 bucks. I think if they're literally the smartest and dumbest things in the entire world, it's like economize. You could literally take everyone's life and, and then babbling around for hours on podcasts and videos and then kind of like condense it, go through it, refine it put it through refining fire, take out impurities and pop. There goes the book. And it's all the best stuff in the most condensed format in the entire world. It's like, you know, eating cal like a thousand calories in a one bite bean. So anyway, I, I believe that's insane value. People are going to want to go grab it. It's like a cent per page. My gosh, come on, or, you know, 10 cents page, whatever it is. Is that worth it? 10 pages a day, a dollar a day. Let's go. Uh, but anyway, I, I believe that's super huge. And also they're hearing some great strategy in that. Right? We always talk about like, listen to what people are saying, but also listen to why they're saying it. Like that's a phenomenal thing to do. $500 worth of value that you could have easily sold or done other things with is coming with the book, makes the book price seem lower because now it's not just a book, but it's not just digital either. There's a physical copy. So even if someone tries to, well, I'll, I'll try to send you the course logins and I'll do this. Well, like they have to get the physical book, they have to buy the book. So there's a huge thing there. You're also launched. Like they should go in there and, and take, do it, participate and learn. How do you feel in this challenge? How, how does he deliver to you? How, does he write you emails? And I always believe like put, be a, be a, a student and, and be a product of the product and go in there, see yeah. how you feel so that when you're speaking to your audience, you can go, I know how you feel right now. You may be asking yourself, should I go put my info in to buy a book? I felt that way too. I actually just bought Dave's book two months ago and I've been going through his challenge and I, I almost didn't pull out my card and here's what I've had happen. So anyway, I know that I'm, I'm selling the book as well as learn all yeah. different ways. Participate. Don't just try to learn from saying, oh, Dave added $500 worth of value. Let me go do that. No, immerse yourself, invest in it. Where your money is, your heart is also plant some seeds in what he's doing because obviously good soil. Yeah. I mean, the, the cool thing is if if nothing else in a, in a jab, 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 right hook, Gary V kind of way, like this is jab, 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 right hook, right? There's just yep. like, it's truly like an over delivery of value. But for me, I wanted to try and use the book coming out as a reason to create community around the idea of courage. Because of course I want people to read the book, like the book in and of itself. And I know I'm super biased, but the book in and of itself is great. At the end of each chapter, there's some active learning with a little bit of homework. Like it is a great resource and well worth the money. But I don't know that I'm going to cultivate something in community if I don't create this opportunity for challenge. And the way that we now have this landing page with these 5,000 people in the first week that are in there, they are every day posting something of hey, accountability posts, I need help with this, or uh, celebration posts, can you give me some cheers for this thing that I'm going to do and pushing into fear myself. Each week, I'm throwing a challenge out to people for them to do one, two, or three things. And they're now posting how their receipt of this challenge is making them feel more empowered and more courageous. 
we haven't even got to the book, right? Like we still have 85 days until the book comes out. And yet they're now creating momentum. They're creating awesome. advocacy. They're doing, so I would encourage anyone to jump in if for nothing else, steal my ideas. Like if there's something <laughs> in how we're doing this that you think, man, that might work for my community, rad. Um, but I'd also encourage you to jump into community because there's 100%. just so many people who are legitimately feeling that thing we've been longing for since this pandemic came along in connection and community that is now being fostered inside of this virtual space. Boom. Well, I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much for jumping on the BDB podcast again. It was great catching up. Phenomenal episode. Appreciate it. Of course, man. I hope, I hope to be back soon. 100%.